All right, hold on, we're doing this now. Got to do this first. Hello, loyal viewers. I'm here to talk to you today about my sponsor, ExpressVPN. Now, as you might be able to tell by the fact that I literally shroud myself in darkness, my privacy is very important to me. That's why I use ExpressVPN, a virtual server that lets me surf anonymously and keeps identity thieves and perhaps overcurious fans out of my personal business. And it has other uses too. Like, imagine if you were a music reviewer on YouTube whose income depended on access to a steady supply of semi-obscure music videos, and it turns out that for some stupid reason, a whole bunch of them are only visible in Europe. That would get annoying and difficult really quickly. That's why I use ExpressVPN, which gets me around all those YouTube region blocks. So if you are, for example, really into J-pop, and boy am I ever, then enjoying your hobby will get a lot easier if you have ExpressVPN. Find out how you can get three months free by going to expressvpn.com slash Todd in the Shadows. The link's in the description. <sighs> Alright, we're good? We're good. On with the show. Okay. Being in a celebrity couple is hard. It's not just trying to maintain a relationship while living in the stressful, invasive world of show business. It's also the cruel, awful public judging your relationship just on how much they like the idea of the two of you together. Whether you look good in photos, how good your story is, if you compliment each other based on some arbitrary criteria, all of which can have nothing to do with the actual relationship. People are still fascinated with the love story of Liz Taylor and Richard Burton, even though their marriage was famously volatile. Meanwhile, I've got no curiosity about Nicole Kidman and Keith Urban, or Jason Sudeikis and Olivia Wilde, even though they all seem perfectly happy. But there's worse than disinterest. Some couples just produce outright revulsion. Whether it be a mismatch in glamour, wildly conflicting energies, or just plain obnoxious behavior, some couples just hit a serious sour note to the world. But of course, any couple who's ever annoyed their friends with PDA can tell you, it's hard to see that people aren't as infatuated with the two of you as you are with each other. Oh, I love you so much. We should do everything together. We'll be the next Johnny and June. We'll be the next Beyonce and Jay-Z. Yeah, and that's how you get shit like Geely, or no end of unpleasant reality shows. And if you think this kind of coupling backfire is a new phenomenon from the TMZ era of celebrity culture, no, this has been going on for a while. For example, my next guest is a very special member of the rock music scene. He's a guitarist, a composer. He's also a very good friend of mine, Mr. Greg Allman. Greg Allman and Cher, the rambling man and the dark lady. She was born in the wagon of a traveling show, and he was born in the backseat of a Greyhound bus. Two huge names in music in the 70s, and for a good four years, they were also husband and wife. Yeah, not something many people think about now, but they were a big deal for a while. They were huge celebrities, they were young and hot and in love, they were all over the magazines, gossiped about by everyone. They were one of music's most prominent power couples. That doesn't mean they were popular. Unfortunately for them, their marriage coincided with severe downward slides for the both of them professionally. They were both still recording, but neither of them had a single hit record during the time they were together. But the worst was to come. In late 1977, the two of them decided to make an album together. Not a single person thought it was a good idea except Cher and Greg. I have doubts about Greg. The result was To The Hard Way, a record that attempted to find a midpoint in their two styles and failed miserably. The record failed, the tour failed, and the marriage failed. It's probably not the record's fault they divorced, but it sure didn't help. How the hell did they think this was going to turn out? Good lord, I feel like I'm dying. This is Train Records. I'd like y'all to uh, meet a good, good, good friend of mine. She's also my wife, Miss Cher Allman. The story of Cher and Greg Allman is, you know, this is all gossip from my parents' generation. It was one of many things I discovered for myself when I was a budding music geek and, you know, when you didn't live through it, and all, all this stuff just kind of gets put in the same category of the past. Burt Reynolds, Donna Summer, Leonid Brezhnev, all part of the same homogenous glob of the 70s to me. But even as a kid, I knew those two people didn't go together. Greg Allman and Cher. Greg Allman, Cher. Greg Allman and Cher. I don't get it. It must have made sense to them, 
They were both coming off really rough patches. When the two started dating in 1975, the Allman Brothers band was falling apart after two major deaths, including Greg's brother Dwayne, plus drug problems and ego clashes, and they eventually broke up in 76. Cher was just coming off a of filing divorce from her husband Sonny, who had steered her entire career up to that point, so she was in scary uncharted waters. And Sonny Bono was controlling, business-minded, and not super masculine. It's easy to guess that Cher went for a loose and wild bad boy like Greg, because he was the exact opposite of Sonny. But he was also the exact opposite of Cher. Like, to be clear, Greg Allman is the singer and keyboard player who, with the Allman Brothers Band, invented Southern rock in the late 60s. And Cher was the glitzy Vegas act with the variety show on CBS. It's just insane to think that this grizzled singer from a biker band best known for hour-long guitar solos could fit musically with a woman who solved mysteries with Scooby-Doo. Putting them together makes about as much sense as... Well... About as much sense as Blake Sheldon and Gwen Stefani. It's exactly like that, really. Awful couple. Just hate looking at them. But actually, hold on. Maybe the matchup didn't have to fail. Joe Cocker was this big lumbering blues growler. He made at least one classic soft cheese duet. The lifters are where we belong. Or for that matter, Lady Gaga's persona doesn't have anything to do with Bradley Cooper or the fictional rock star he played in A Star Is Born. And they made one of the biggest hits of her career. So we'll give a fair shot to Cher and Greg, or Shreg as they were known. No. Well, here was the album opener and first single, Move Me. Okay, okay, well that's a pretty nice, you know, light funk groove they've got going. I'm digging this. Move me. Love the way you move me. And there it goes. Okay, my first thought is this is not really much of a song. It's, I mean, it's kind of thin. No real hook on it. But also, they're just not doing anything to make their voices blend. I think it's pretty clear that the selling point is not the actual music. It's the charge of seeing this real-life couple sing about their real-life love. It just doesn't work, because, and I cannot repeat this enough, Cher and Greg Allman were a terrible couple. The eyes just instinctively turn away from them, especially this terrible boudoir photo album cover. With the wind blowing through Greg's beautiful blonde tresses, like he's Andy Gibb or something, as if the effect isn't completely blown by his grizzly mutton chops and dopey expression on his face. Duh. He looks like an idiot. He makes her look like an idiot by association. Crawling over her in her tube top. Get a room. No one wants to see that. Oh, and notice also that it's ridiculously credited not to Greg or Cher, but to All Man and Woe Man. I guess to try and trick you into thinking that they're like a real separate band and not just a goofy vanity project? Like, this is a marketing disaster. The songs on this could have cured cancer and no one would have bought it with that album cover. Why is her name not the one on the album? It's her album! Look, here's the second song, I Found You Love. It's the Cher and Greg Variety Hour. This doesn't sound a thing like Greg Allman should be on it. It was actually produced by one of his regular producers, but it sounds exactly like the kitschy cover songs Cher would sing on her show. Yeah, I know, it's funny. The pop cheese of the 70s sounds way more authentic than even alt-rock does right now, with, you know, real instruments and everything, but I can still tell the difference. This sounds like something Elvis Presley would have performed at his very fattest. So why isn't this working? Why aren't they synergizing? A lot of these songs are covers, so they were hits for somebody. It's not the song's fault. It's not like Cher can't duet. She started her career as part of a duo. And yes, Greg is a different kind of singer than Sonny Bono, but so what? Cher has duetted with tons of people. Tons. See? 
Especially on her show, people watched her perform with wildly different vocalists week after week, including Greg. And it's not like she can't rock and roll either. My favorite Cher songs are from her arena rock period in the 80s. So, what's going on here? Okay, well, here's my explanation for why none of that works in this album's favor. If you ever go. First off, Cher has a very weird, inflexible voice. Depending on who you talk to, autotune became a thing entirely to hide her vocal deficiencies. And Sonny Bono was a bad singer, but in a way that complemented Cher's peculiar singing. It doesn't really work with an actual good singer like Greg. And the TV show, that's a show. What works on TV doesn't necessarily work on a vinyl record. Kelly Clarkson is not going to release a full CD of Kelly Oki. The Masked Singer is not on Spotify. As for Cher's arena pop era, that was way in the future. The power ballad had barely been invented yet in 77, and Greg Allman was not that kind of rock star anyway. He wasn't a rhinestone cowboy, he wasn't a corporate rocker, and no matter how many glittery outfits he puts on, he just cannot glam up enough for this. But I knew all that going into this. What I didn't see coming is how little Greg sounds like he's even trying. Which is weird, right? Like, I've seen power couple projects like this fail, but not because either of the two people didn't want to be there. Well, uh, I actually got a copy of his book, so why don't we see what he said. On Cher, I was really glad she never asked me what I thought of her singing, because I'm sorry, but she's not a very good singer. Huh. Well, that's a bad omen for the album. I admit, I have never found her voice all that pleasant myself, but she's been a beloved world-famous vocalist for almost six decades, so I can see she's obviously done something right. Also, I'm not married to her. Well, anyway. I tried to talk to her about her singing, I tried to show her some inflections, and she showed some interest. Finally, she said, why don't you produce a record for me? Boy, this album has the stink of yes, dear, all over it. Okay, here's the song that started the project, apparently. Cover of Smokey Robinson's You Really Gotta Hold On Me. Greg writes in his memoir that he was in the shower and Cher came up behind him and started singing it and he joined in. Hold, please, hold, oh, please. And they made a full version of it on the record, so it's very personal to them. It sounds very sexy and romantic. If you don't know the song. Really Gotta Hold On Me is one of the great classic tunes about toxic codependence. It is a song of total misery. You wouldn't think of it that way because it's got that classic Motown sound, but it's not a good sign when your marriage inspires your wife to start singing, I don't like you. Yeah, if you can't tell by that, Cher and Greg Allman were a hot gossip couple for all the wrong reasons. A day in the life of... Uh of Cher and Greg Allman was... <laughs> Greg Allman was your classic rock and roll fuck up. He had bad problems with drugs and alcohol, he'd go missing for days. There were reports of them going out to eat at like a fancy restaurant and him passing out in the linguine. And everyone was hearing about this stuff and people were tired of them. They were overexposed. So you have this album full of songs about them being in love and having sex. Live off your old no one was happy for them, certainly not their respective fan bases. To his fans, she was the Yoko that broke up the band and turned him into a showbiz phony in stupid outfits. To her fans, Greg was the pants-pissing wasteoid ruining her life. It's probably not wrong to guess that Cher, like so many troubled couples, was trying to make a big public show of how in love they were, and that everyone was wrong about them and they were actually gonna make it. For example, this one song called, We're Gonna Make It. Might have to eat beans every day. song about how they may not have much money and everyone thinks they can't survive, but gosh darn it, they will. Together. I don't know if you know this, but Cher already had a song like that. With her first husband, it was called I Got You Babe. I got you, babe. You might have heard of it. We won't make it. I know it will. So what it seems like is her trying to remake her old career with her new husband. Holy shit, she performed this actual same song with Sonny. Wow. Did she just cut and paste Greg's face on their old albums too? Well, in any case, it doesn't work. Feels weird to say this, but Greg Allman is no Sonny Bono. Cher and Sonny had so much on-stage chemistry that they were able to pack venues even after they divorced. 
Cher and Greg, from what I could find, have no onstage chemistry. It's really kind of impressive. He's all about the music, man, not the pageantry, so he's not even looking at her. Cher's eyes are on him the entire time, like she's trying to sell it at least. He's just not picking up the hint. And he also just sounds really disinterested. Though that might be because he's got enough junk in his veins to kill a sperm whale. And as badly as the album did, the tour did even worse. They were just supposed to go on a quick, month-long tour of Europe. I don't think they had any problems selling any tickets. The problem was that Greg Allman had fans, and Cher had fans. But Greg Allman and Cher did not have fans. So you'd have this tuxes and pearls crowd expecting a Caesars Palace show versus a bunch of roughnecks and hippies wanting to smoke pot and hear some goddamn rock and roll. The tour was called off after a week because the two different groups were getting in fights. Allman Brothers fans were fighting with Cher fans. I think we have footage of this. You proved, you proved, you proved, you <laughs> now I'm not gonna lie and tell you the album is 100% terrible. I don't blame you much for wanting to be free. They do a duet on Jimmy Webb's Do What You Gotta Do, which is a sad breakup song. You just do what you gotta do. Even though their voices are still mismatched, there is some emotion there. Especially knowing that they wouldn't last much longer. Probably not great for them that their breakup songs sound better than their love songs. Honestly, it would probably have been better and more successful if they just leaned into the chaos of their marriage. I meant to call her name. I meant to take her hand. And there was one song I liked a lot called Shadow Dream Song, which was written by a very young Jackson Brown back in the 60s. A couple people have done versions of it, but Allman does the best one I found. Was that song she sang in the morning about the princess? And the prince. I think this is actually really good. Up there with the classic Allman tracks. And it's worth noting that Cher is barely on it. So yeah, that's my verdict. It's not a total loss. So why don't we finish off with one of the final tracks called I Love Making Love to You. This is straight up a Captain and Tennille song. Yeah, screw this, we're done. <laughs> no, no, actually, why don't we let this song stand as a symbol for the entire record? It's every problem with this record in one song. First, it's a gross display of love by a couple no one liked to begin with, and it's layered with enough corny, Vegasy, Tony Orlando style horns and backup singers to mark it as irredeemably lame. This whole album sounds like the Family Feud theme. That's the main problem with this entire record. It sounds like 70s cheese TV. It's the Greg and Cher Almond Family Variety Smile Time Hour with special guests, the Harlem Globetrotters. Now, in the aftermath, Cher said she loved making the record, but quote, that album didn't stand a chance. Everybody hated that we were together. Meanwhile, Greg said, that record sucked, man. It bit the dirt and it didn't sell shit. There was one, maybe two decent songs on that record, but it was basically terrible, just awful. Jesus. Cher divorced him for good in 1979, and by that point the tabloids barely even covered it because everyone was so sick of them. And yes, he actually can blame the record for their divorce, arguably. He started drinking again on the tour and that was the final straw for her. This album feels a lot like having a baby to save the marriage. It's bad for the both of you and it fucks up the baby. So, Train Records is supposed to be a show about career-ending albums. Did it? Well, funny thing about that. I once found a list of the biggest flop albums, as measured by the biggest sales drop from the album before. Cher is on this list nine times. So it seems there's no disaster she can't weather. Things did not go so well for Greg, whose classic records with the Allman Brothers were well behind him at that point, and who didn't beat his substance abuse problems for decades. That said, the band reunited shortly after this, and that next album did okay, and Greg Solo had a minor comeback in the late 80s, so arguably this is not a train record in the truest sense. But I'll tell you what, it sure as hell ended the career of Allman and Woman. That band broke up and never reunited, thank the fucking lord. And if I could turn back time, if I could find a way, I would make sure this album never existed. Oof.